In this video, we will introduce the topic of limits. We need limits to help us evaluate instantaneous rates of change. So let's look at the definition of instantaneous rate of change. Let's let f of x be a function defined at x equals a and at nearby points. To evaluate the instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x at x equals a, we need to complete a two-step process. First, we calculate and simplify change in f divided by change in x, which is f evaluated a plus h minus f evaluated at a divided by a plus h minus a. In other words, we calculate the average rate of change of f with respect to x on the closed interval from a to a plus h. We then simplify this expression as much as we possibly can. Secondly, we identify what happens to this simplified answer when h is small or when h is very close to zero. If the numbers produced by this average rate of change, f evaluated a plus h minus f evaluated a divided by h, gets close to one and only one number, this number is the instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x at x equals a. Using limits, we can condense everything from the previous slide into a fairly simple, compact expression. The instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x at x equals a is given by the limit of f evaluated at a plus h minus f evaluated at a divided by h as h goes to zero. In this expression, we see those two steps. f evaluated at a plus h minus f evaluated at a divided by h tells us to calculate and simplify the average rate of change of f with respect to x on the closed interval from a to a plus h. The limit out in front tells us to identify what happens to this average rate of change of f with respect to x on the closed interval from a to a plus h when h is very close to zero. In other words, what one number or value results. Let's look more closely at limits. We let f of x be a function defined at points near x equals c. And we say that the limit of f of x as x approaches c equals l if, when we substitute values for x very close to c, but not equal to c, into the function f of x, the output values, f of x, get close to l and no other number. Let's consider a couple of examples. First, let's look at the limit of x squared minus 4 as x approaches 3. We'll see how we can demonstrate that that limit is equal to 5. Using the notation from the previous page, we see that the function f of x is our x squared minus 4. We're looking at what happens to x squared minus 4 as x is close to 3, which is our c value, and we're going to see that the limit is equal to 5. We can look at this limit numerically. In other words, we can consider a table of values where our x values are values close to 3. Suppose we have x equals 2.5. Substituting 2.5 into my value of x, I get 2.5 squared minus 4, which is 2.25. As I choose values of x that are closer to 3, suppose 2.9 or 2.95, and I substitute these values in for x into my function, I get 4.41 and 4.7025 respectively. I can also go on the other side of 3 and again get closer to 3. If I look at x equals 3.5, the output is 8.25. If x is equal to 3.01, the output is 5.0601. And when I take 3.0001, square it and subtract 4, I get 5.0006001. So we can see that as x approaches 3 from either side of 3, the output of x squared minus 4 gets close to 5. I can also look at this limit graphically. So in this case, I'm going to graph the function y equals x squared minus 4, and I want to focus in on what happens to the y values as the x values get close to 3. Here we see a graph of y equals x squared minus 4, and I also have a point on the parabola. I have both the x and y values of that point, so in this case, two, x is 2.713 and the y value is 3.358. As we move the point P so that the x gets closer to 3, the y value gets closer to 5. 
This also happens as I'm on the other side of x equals 3. So here x is equal to 3.062, y is equal to 5.378. As I get even closer to x equals 3, the y value gets closer to 5. If I zoom in on the function, when the value of x is close to 3, I again can move the point p so that as x gets closer to 3, we see that the y value gets closer to 5. It's important when giving graphical evidence in support of a limit that you give a sketch of the graph on a window that's very near the point of emphasis. So in this case, I want to clearly indicate the window dimensions of the graph. So I want to state the intervals for the x-axis and the y-axis. So in this particular graph, x is between 2.75 and 3.25. The y values are between 3.5 and 7. So this could help us to identify that as x is close to 3, the y value is very close to 5. Both the numerical and graphical evidence supports that the limit of x squared minus 4 as x approaches 3 is equal to 5. Let's consider another example. Let's look at the limit of negative 2t minus 8 divided by t plus 4 as t approaches negative 4. Numerically, I can consider a table of values, and I can consider values of t that are close to negative 4 and on either side of negative 4. Notice in this table I don't have the value of t equaling negative 4, because if I did, I would get 0 divided by 0, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. If t is equal to negative 4.5, negative 2 times negative 4.5 minus 8 divided by negative 4.5 plus 4 gives us a negative 2. Similarly, when t is equal to negative 4.1, the output is negative 2. Same thing with negative 4.0001, the output's negative 2. The same is true for values on the other side of negative 4. If t is equal to negative 3.75, negative 3.93, negative 3.9999998, all those output values are negative 2. So we can see that as t approaches negative 4 from both the left and from the right side, the output of negative 2t minus 8 divided by t plus 4 is always a negative 2. So that supports that the limit of negative 2t minus 8 divided by t plus 4 as t approaches negative 4 is equal to negative 2. If I graph y equals negative 2t minus 8 divided by t plus 4, I get a horizontal line. And again, if I have a point p on this function, if I look at the x values as x gets pro uh, close to negative 4, the y values stay at negative 2. And this happens on either side of t equals negative 4. I can also consider what's called an analytical approach to evaluating a limit. In this case, I want to try to simplify the expression as much as possible. So when I look at negative 2t minus 8 divided by t plus 4, I see that I can factor a negative 2 in the numerator. So the expression equals a negative 2 times t plus 4 divided by t plus 4. I can multiply by a form of 1 so that now I have negative 2 times t plus 4 divided by t plus 4 times that form of 1, which is 1 over t plus 4 divided by 1 over t plus 4 and I get negative 2 as long as t is not equal to negative 4. So when invest investigating limits, if we look at the kinds of evidence we can give, we can give numerical evidence. And when we do so, we need to use at least two values on each side of the c and very close to c. It should be clear to the audience what the trend of the output values is. We can also give graphical evidence. And when we do so, we need to record the equation entered into the calculator of the computer. We need to consider the graph of the function on a very small interval, which contains the value c. We need to make sure we identify the window dimensions for the graph on the sketch of the graph. And we need to clearly state the conclusion as to what the limit of the function is as x approaches c. And we need to make sure that those two supports, numerical and graphical, agree. When investigating limits analytically, any time you get the limit of the function as x approaches c as 0 over 0, you simply must do more work. 0 over 0 is called an indeterminate form. 
So instead, you need to simplify the expression. In other words, you need to use some algebra to identify common factors in the numerator and denominator, or you might need to multiply by a form of 1. Let's consider again the instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x at x equals a, which we said earlier that this is the limit of f evaluated at a plus h minus f evaluated at a divided by h as h approaches 0. When we look at this limit, h is the variable. We're interested in what happens as h gets close to 0, where 0 is the c, and the function is actually f evaluated a plus h minus f evaluated at a divided by h. We're interested in what happens to that function or that output as h gets close to 0. When we get a value for this limit, this limit is the instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x at x equals a.